um, let me start by saying the spirit of reconciliation, the Citizen Society of Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections through land, sea and community. And we pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, Islander people uh, present today. Uh, so welcome and thank you everyone for coming to this uh, SSA Canberra Dibs lecture meeting. My name is Francis, I'm the current president of the Canberra branch for SSA. Um, just before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, unless you are speaking, um, then it's preferable if you keep your uh, mute your audio just to try and minimize the feedback and any interruptions. Um, video is entirely up to you as to whether you want to leave it um, on or off. Uh, furthermore, note that this uh, meeting is being recorded um, and will be made available to SSA members afterwards. Um, obviously, we will sort of uh, chop out the, the beginning sort of pre-meeting mingling bit, um, but the uh, lecture itself will be uh, recorded. Um, also, for those who are unaware, the Stats Society is the national body that represents all statisticians, data scientists from all across the country. And if you want to find out more about the events, workshops, meetings, and all that cool stuff that occurs both nationally and in your local state or territory, uh, please visit www.statsoc.org.au. Uh, so the NIBS lecture in particular is the last lecture um, in the calendar year for the Canberra branch, and it is named after Sir George Hanley NIBS. Uh, who, for those who don't know, it was Australia's first Commonwealth statistician, uh, helping run the census in 1911. And he was actually also the first director for the Commonwealth Institute of Science and Industry, which, is a, uh, which was a predecessor to CSIRO. And today it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Raymond Carroll from Texas A&M uh, zooming in from the States uh, to give this uh, NIBS lecture. Uh, this year's NIBS lecture is also a little bit special, uh, and also partly why we invited Professor Carroll to give this lecture is because it's a it's also, we're celebrating uh, Professor Alan Welsh's 60th birthday and his contributions to statistical research, as well as the statistical community, both, um, I guess, within Canberra, nationally, as well as internationally. And so after uh, Professor Carroll's presentation, we will have the pleasure of um, inviting uh, Professor Welsh to say a few words. So that's pretty much enough for me. I'm now gonna pass it on to Professor Michael Martin, who's actually gonna be chairing today's meeting. Uh, Michael is a, another professor of statistics at the Australian National University. Uh, he's also the current webmaster for SSA Canberra, and very importantly, uh, is longtime friends with both uh, Professor Carroll and Professor Welsh. So uh, I want to thank Michael for helping uh, put this session together, and uh, I'll pass it now over to him to get things uh, rocking and rolling. Thanks, Francis, and welcome along, everybody. It's, uh, you know, a, a, a fair while ago, we, we had a bit of a dream about what we might do uh, <clears throat> to uh, celebrate Alan's advancing years. And uh, we thought we'd be able to get everybody to come to Canberra. Uh, well, 2020 happened, uh, COVID, yeah. And uh, no, nobody can come to Canberra. Uh, although as of yesterday, I think Victorians can come to Canberra, but that's about it. Uh, so we've had to do this in a different way. Now, we are gonna do something much more, well, hesitate to use the word normal uh, when we can, uh, but for the moment, uh, the NIBS lecture is gonna be doing some heavy lifting. It's gonna help us celebrate Alan's birthday, which uh, was on Pi Day, 314 in the American direction. And, uh, you know, Alan is uh, transcendental to us, as, uh, as you might imagine, so it's, it's very appropriate. We're also really lucky to have uh, Ray who Alan and, and, and I, but Alan has known for, well, decades. Uh, and and uh, it's just so wonderful that we can welcome you back to Canberra, Ray, even if it's in this virtual form. Uh, Ray, and I'll, I'll give a proper, uh, a proper rendition of, of uh, Ray's incredible uh, career in a second, but uh, Ray's an honorary Canberran. Uh, if you were here earlier in the in the chat, you would have heard he's been here over 17 of his summers. And uh, that's longer than most people will tolerate Canberra. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just lovely to see you again, Ray. Uh, we wish we could see you in person, uh, but we know we will again soon because we know the call of Tidbin Villa and uh, we know it's calling you, so there you go. So today, uh, very honoured to have Ray to speak in honour of Alan and uh, Nibs comes a poor third, I guess, in this, uh, in this contest. 
So uh, let me give you a brief introduction to, to Ray. Uh, most people here, I guess, know Ray very well. And so this is, might be the boring part, but for those who don't know Ray, he's Distinguished Professor of Statistics and Nutrition at Texas A&M University and College Station and Distinguished Professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, which of course uh, we all know well. Uh, he was the first statistician to receive the US National Cancer Institute Merit Award. He's the director of the Texas A&M Institute for Applied Mathematics and Computational Science. And he served as the editor of Biometrica, Biometrica and of course for JASA for many years. Uh, he's won many honors in the profession, including the COPS Prize and the Fisher Award and lecture. And he's a member of the AAAS. Now, Ray's, uh, Ray's talk today is uh, the short title, uh, I think, must have been communicated to Ray by my mother. Uh, nutrition is important, right? She used to tell me that. And so I imagine this is how Ray found out uh, to, to call his talk that. Um, but of course, I, I suspect it's a bit deeper than my mother's knowledge of nutrition. So uh, I'm looking forward to this indeed. I'll be able to communicate back to mum uh, where she's got it all so wrong over these many years. Uh, you know, when I first saw Ray's talk was on nutrition, I thought Ray works on everything, right? And of course he does. His research has been very diverse and has focused on complex data scenarios, uh, recently including methodology for multivariate functional data of different types, data integration across platforms and outcomes, uncertainties of predictive measurement, that is measurement error, gene environment interactions, general sermon parametrics, molecular biology of nutrition, radiation epidemiology, and the risk of thyroid cancer and physical activity. It might have been quicker to mention what Ray doesn't work on. He's deeply involved in nutritional surveillance, nutritional epidemiology, and dietary patterns, where data complexity is immense due to the multivariate nature of dietary intakes and the uncertainties of dietary ascertainment. So with that, let me now hand over to Ray and I'll ask Ray to share his screen with the talk. Uh, and we will hear that nutrition is important. Thank you so much, Ray. Sure, Michael, thanks. By the way, that is my short title. I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah. Uh, let me see. So I have to move this sucker. Started sharing. Not yet. Not yet. No. There it is. Nutrition is important. There. Now. Oh, yeah. It's got to hit the right buttons. So, am I sharing now? Can anybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try and expand this, but I don't know if it's going to work. It's, nope. Doesn't look good. Ah, sure. Okay. All right. So, yes, as, as Michael said, uh, nutrition is important. I think it really is important. These are my particulars here. And then uh, I'm going to talk about why I do statistics and nutrition. And I have a particular pet peeve about kale for all things, but magic bullets are the bane of nutrition. And I'm going to do uh, a little epidemiology and then uh, a, a little more of population surveillance, which is trying to figure out in your population what, what people are eating. And as uh, Michael said, I'm an honorary distinguished professor at UTS, thanks to Matt Wand and Louise. And I consider myself a professor at ANU, even though I'm not honored. Okay. Uh, and I want to thank the NIBS committee for inviting me. Uh, out, coincidentally, Alan gave this lecture exactly 20 years ago. And I do wish I could be in Canberra. Uh, when I got the invitation, it was before COVID took over the world. And I had already started planning some trips to Bindilla, Namaji, and then beyond and into the, into the central desert. But oh well, next time. 
Um, I met Alan in 1984 when he was on his way to Canberra from the U.S. And it was at a JSM after a talk I had given or he had given, I can't remember. And when I came here in 1987 for the first time, we wrote a little paper that appeared a couple years later in the American Statistician. And since then, we've published five more papers. And they're all in pretty good journals. So I think that's a pretty high rate of very good journals. And they've been all been a pleasure. They are all written here. And so here, I'm talking about Can Canberra. So yeah, it's, a, it's been a great relationship. So this is the first summer that I, American summer, I, your winter, where I was renting a hobby farm in Queenbian, outside of Queenbian, 50 acres or 40 acres or something. And my mother came and so we, we had a barbecue at the place and eventually people walked up a little bit. So this is, Lots of Australian statisticians. From the left, it's Matt Wand, then Michael. Peter Diggle was here at the time. Peter Hall was hiding behind Peter Diggle. That's Peter Diggle's former wife and, uh, and his two kids. Then Jeannie Hall, uh, Mary Welsh, and Alan Welsh. And it was a lovely, well, you know, in the winter, it never rains in, in Canberra. So it was great. It was really wonderful time. So I visited Canberra almost every American summer through 2005 or so. And Alan, Mary, and the two girls took me in occasionally, fed me, <laughs> always a good thing. And then the highlight of all that was in 2004, maybe 2005, they left for Europe and I stayed at their house for a month. And then they had two new kitten kittens, Archie and Monty, and says Texas A&M, ha ha, got it? So Archie and Monty. And this is me. Alan could tell us what, which one is which. There's a little black cat over here on the, on closer to my face, and then the little black and white cat. And they were extremely affectionate. And I guess kittens, you should, often are. They were maybe six months old, I don't remember, but they were so much, they were a boatload of fun, but they were also very active. And so if I turned on the water at the sink, I had two cats trying to grab the water in the sink. And uh, here they are. They, I've had cats and they don't really much care for water, but these two were fascinated by the faucet and the sink. And then the other thing is they were kittens. And so this is the second night I came home from my office and they knocked over every chair, but one or two in the living room, dining room. And they knocked over the cover of the dining room and they knocked over a lot of things. And so I, I made it my goal to make that house cat proof for a month. And it was a wonderful time. So the talk here is very informal, not technical. Uh, I think nutrition is very complex. I've been studying it for a long time. And I know a lot of people who are trying to make public health recommendations in nutrition. And there are crazes, there are real crazes in it. And there are good scientific papers and short-term studies, which aren't very good, and lots else. So nutrition is very controversial. So there was an interesting but very negative article in the New York Times by Gary Taubes in February 8th, 2014. And he says, we have to have more clinical trials. Well, as I'll point out in a second, you can't do clinical trials very easily in nutrition because they're enormously expensive and for other reasons. And in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2018, they did a small study uh, comparing a healthy low-fat diet 
versus a healthy, low carbohydrate diet on weight change at 12 months. And then there's the related questions, are they related to genotype pattern or insulin secretion? I thought this was a stupid trial. Uh, I don't think focusing on fat or carbohydrates makes no sense to me. It's the, and I'll call this the magic bullet theory, but basically they found no significant difference, neither, nor, no genotype patterns, no insulin secretion or anything like that. And I could have told them this was going to be true. And I didn't even have to do the study. And th the other thing is, well, the College Station Eagle tried to make it nice as they say, what seemed to make a difference was healthful eating. This is my local paper in Texas. And participants on both types who consumed the fewest, the fewest processed foods, sugary drinks, unhealthy fats, and ate the most veggies, lost the most weight. And that's true. That's just true. And they, they also said precision medicine is not as important as eating mindfully. I rather like this quote. It's not mine, but I agree with it. So I got interested in nutrition as a science in, in the 1990s. And I started working with two very, very good nutritionists, Joanne Lupton, who's since passed away, and Nancy Turner, who is the chair at Michigan State. And they did really simple experiments. And this is the day before microarrays or anything, all these other things that people are now very excited about. And what they did is they fed a group of rats a corn oil enriched diet. And I always thought of it as the potato chip diet because at the time I was eating a lot of potato chips. And then you feed another group a fish oil enhanced diet and everything else was equal. And I, I don't know if rats munch, but they, they munched happily away on their diets for a while. And years later, we showed that there were 3,000 genes that were statistically significant in terms of, statistically significantly different in terms of mRNA expressions with a false discovery rate of 0.05, which is a pretty impressive finding. So then we exposed them, the nutritionists exposed them to a potent carcinogen, it's called AOM, but it's a very sacrifice these rats nine and 12 hours at, later after the exposure. And what was so astonishing for me is everything lit up. Uh, anything you could measure, there was a statistically significant difference between the potato chip diet and the, the fishing they repair, apoptosis, uh, program cell death. Oh, it looks like we have a technical glitch. We seem to have lost Ray. So let me see what we can do. He's gone uh, to mute, Michael, somehow. Can I, uh, yeah, I'm looking for his tile here. No, oh, there he is. Okay, now I'm muted, I hope. So Ray, Ray can, you, can you reshare your screen there, Ray? Or? Yep, beautiful. Yeah, that's what I just did. So these were pretty astonishing results, I thought. And they actually made me change my diet. First of all, I got fascinated with diet, nutrition. And that's why I'm a member of the Department of Nutrition. And, and better diets can protect against cancers, chronic diseases, mortalities, et cetera. And the personal story is, I used to eat top corner chips daily and then stopped and lost 30 pounds. Uh, so that's also a good moral of the story. 
But it really is true that when you, it's especially obvious when you start feeding rats different diets, that you get huge dietary effects. And then there's the question of what about humans? Well, the one statistic success was uh, my former student, Jeff Morris, who I'm sure some of you know, he's, he's biostatistics chair at the University of Pennsylvania. And he wrote his thesis on this problem and used it to discover Waywood-based functional mixed models, blah, blah. The, the nutritionist got six papers in top statistics journals. They could have gotten tenure. Um, they, they, there's Annals papers, JASA papers, Biometrica paper, et cetera. So they were very pleased with themselves and started calling themselves statisticians. All right, well, this is, this is Joanne is on the top and Nancy's on the bottom. This one is doesn't ruin, uh, the left is fish oil, the right is corn oil. And the only thing that you, you really care about here is that um, this is adducts, which are basically damage. And, uh, if, and this is corn oil. And you want more adducts. And then this is apoptosis, programmed cell death, and you want more programmed cell death. The x-axis has something to do with the location of the cells in uh, corn crisps. So there's just, I just want to show this to show you there are really quite big differences between the two kinds of diets. So this was followed up by a dietary modification trial called the Women's Health, Health Initiative. And that's a very, very famous study because of its of, of, of hormone replacement therapy. But they did a diet study. They had 50,000 women uh, who were in an age to develop breast cancer. The control group were, I don't know, they were the, they were the free living thing. And then they have a randomized group and they wanted to lower your fat, their fat to 20% of calories, saturated fat to 7% of calories, five or more servings of fruit and veggies today and grains up to, to six or more servings per day. The typical American diet has 35% of calories from fat, saturated fats, 15%, etc. So this is a very hard thing to accomplish. It made a lot of sense theoretically, but you're dealing with people, not male spray, spray dolly rats. And so they didn't really accomplish that. So what happened? The p-value for breast cancer was 0.07. And I was in Canberra at the time and went to find the New York Times at the at the uh, at the embassy, American Embassy. And the p-value was 0.07. And the New York Times headlined it as a failed study. I think a 0.07 is pretty, pretty bloody impressive, given that these were humans. Colorectal cancer and coronary and vascular disease were also had p values between 0.05 and 0.10. Very expensive, something like $400 million. Very, you know, highly randomized, very rigorous follow-up. And, but $400 million, even for our government, my government, I don't, I don't know if it's mine, but ours, is a lot of money. And that nothing this large has been done since then. And I, nobody thinks there's going to be a diet like that. A, a dietary intervention trial, trial like that. So maybe it can never be done, probably not. So instead what people have been doing is a lot of cohort studies of diet and health. And you know, cohort follow-up follow studies, they're not randomized, but they have huge sample sizes that you know, 
you can take that grain of, grain, of, grain of salt. Now, the study I have worked on for years is the National Institutes of Health, American Association for Retired Persons Study of Diet and Health, which has 300,000 men and 200,000 women. And they're followed for various cancers, coronary vascular disease, mortalities of different types. And the first thing anybody did with this is they looked at saturated fat. So that's the, the somehow saturated fat is, is a bad thing. I'm, I'm sure it is, but it's, it's, they focused on, this is my one shot. They focused on saturated fat and they adjusted for 25 plus covariates. They're epidemiologists, that's fine. And they compared the fifth quintile of saturated fat to the first quintile of fat, saturated fat. And whatever we think of this as a statistical device, this is what people do in nutritional epidemiology. And I want to just point out that they focused on saturated fat. This is the only dietary component that they looked at. And so blah, here's the, this is a Cox regression and the hazard ratios, well, you can see the p-values and you can see the hazard ratios may as well be one. And uh, that the fifth quintile should be worse than the first quintile since saturated fat is not good for you. And well, yeah, maybe so, but this, this is, this is, this is what you get in nutritional epidemiology if you look at one thing at a time. Even if you adjust for a million covariates, it, it's, it's, this always happens. So I did this, I mean, it's a dismal result. And I did it, I've done it for good veggies, dark green kale, et cetera, and others, and nothing shows up. You do one dietary component at a time, nothing is ever statistically significant. And remember, these sample sizes are in the hundreds of thousands. Coronary vascular disease, CVD, uh, was accepted, but it wasn't all that impressive. And this is why I hate these one shot at a time things, because they don't take into account that we eat lots of foods. So here's one of the things that makes people crazy. So uh, it, it's vast, simply vast. So I went on the web and looked up chocolate and breast cancer. And you're thinking, why did I do that? Well, there was a theory that chocolate, I can't remember, was good for you if you're a woman and, and don't get breast cancer. And I, I actually was work, worked on a case control study where that ended up being statistically significant. But this particular article, is the worst written statistical analysis I've ever written because they used a lot of words, but most of them were on the one hand, but on the other hand, blah, blah, blah. Now, I have worked with two very good nutritionists, one of whom, before she passed, was in the National, American National Academy of Science. And, and now I work with a lot of nutritionists at the National Cancer Institute. And, and they're trying to make public health recommendations that are simple and that people can understand. I mean, and that's, that's crucial to actually affect public health. So I don't think restricting calories, that's really hard to do. Eating lots of kale, well, that's easier. In fact, I have a nephew who I'm very close to and they make a kale smoothie every morning for breakfast. They also make bacon and eggs. <laughs> so a little bit of a there, but I don't like kale. So I don't think it's particularly pleasurable. And you get this every time you open up the newspaper and they have a nutrition article, there's a new magic diet. And, and the question everybody wants to know is what should I eat? And that can't be answered. I don't think that can be answered. And it's because of st it's a statistical problem. And, and that is diet in humans is very complicated. And since y'all are, statistici are statisticians, it's really 
the way that it's measured, multivariate compositional data. Uh, it's, it's not the total amounts, it's the amounts per calorie. And, uh, it's, it's compositional data and it's really multivariate and it's gotta be treated, in my mind, as a multivariate problem, multivariate predictors. It's hard to change one's energy. I mean, you know, that's, that's a caloric intake for long periods of time. It can be done, but it, it's kind of hard to do. Well, let's start with that as a simplistic starting point. Then what's known is if you decrease your saturated fat intake, generally something else needs to increase to keep the energy or caloric intake more or less the same. And it's not classical compositional data, but it is sort of compositional. Nutritionists have, at least the good ones, have long figured this out. They, they use the buzzword, a substitution effect. If you're gonna decrease your saturated fat intake, you've got to substitute it with something else. Makes sense. And so what nutritionists have been doing for, oh gosh, 20 years now, is they make up diet indices that account for lots of things in diets. And they don't do just one bullet at a time. I've, I've actually convinced all the all my nutritionists anyway. And by the way, that's a funny thing to say to my nutritionists, but a lot of you who work with medical doctors, uh, you hear them call you my statisticians. Um, and this thing, the healthy eating index, is just one of them. Uh, you've heard of the Mediterranean diet, diet, which has an index, and there's the Harvard index and lots of other things. So this particular index was, was a collaboration between the U.S. National Cancer Institute and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it's based on dietary guidelines put out by the USDA. But you will see this in, in when I look at milk before, Harvard, Harvard epidemiologists, uh, nutritionists, think it's totally influenced by industry lobbyists. There's nothing worse than industry. So the 2005 is easy to look at, and it's a score based on the dietary guidelines, whether you like them or not. It's a multi-component dietary quality index. It involves ratios of how much you eat of certain things, like saturated fat or red meat compared to your caloric intake. So it, in that sense, it's compositional data. Then they score it and you get a score from zero to hundred and higher scores are better. The, the typical American has a score of around 53. So we're not too, too well, but that's true. So this is, I focus on milk. I, first of all, I don't like milk. So, uh, so every thousand calories, you're supposed to have 1.3 cups equivalent to get the best score, which is 10. And no milk, you get the lowest score. Well, the, the funny part about this, this thing is the Harvard University index penalizes milk. And do some, some do, do some of the indices based on the Mediterranean diet. And then another one that they really heavily penalize, this is up to 20% of the score, is calories from solid fats, alcohol beverages, and added sugar. Added sugars are basically soft drinks, solid fats, I'm not sorry. Alcohol beverages though, they, they do a bad thing. And that is they penalize red wine. And I don't think anybody should be penalizing red wine because I like red wine. Uh, so those are uh, empty calories. Uh, the another one is, is dark green and orange vegetables and legumes, which is DOL. Those are good for you, supposedly. I believe they are. So they, they have, there's 13 comp components, and they're all, I mean, 12 really unique ones, and then all compared to energy. And you can see what we've got here. Uh, they give more points to meat, meat and beans, 
which is a funny combination since meats are supposed to be bad for you and beans are, are supposed to be good for you, uh, sodium and empty calories. So this is the 2005 index. The, the, the most recent index is more complicated. And they, the way they score the system is they take total fruits, for example, uh, and they adjust them for caloric intake, kilocalories, thousands of kilocalories. And so it's the cup of total fruits divided by the kilocalories. And basically, you start at zero if you don't have any total fruit. And you go up to, up to 0.08, you get a score of 0.05. And then it stops above 0.05. They think, well, how much fruit can you eat? And they decided that it stays at 0.05, which is an, a reasonable thing to do, I think. Total fruits, good fruits are good. Total fruits include fruit juices. The empty calories goes the other way. You get a wonderful score if you don't have, if less than 50%, if more than, if 20% or more of your diet is made up of If more than half of your diet is made up of empty calories, you get a score of zero. If less than 20% of, of your diet is less, is empty calories. And uh, then this is just, this is what it looks like. And so this, this basically uh, says what nutritionists think empty calories are. And of course, uh, my beef is with the red wine. And then with these scores, and I showed you what happened if you did one thing at a time, but now with these scores, because there's, there's really 12 different things, it's compositional data and scored in a way, particular way, and the hazard ratios, you want them to be less than one. And I, I don't want to really read the ratios, but if you look for everything except breast cancer, the p values are zero. And this makes sense to me. This is, this, uh, when I did this analysis, I realized that this was, this was perfect. I mean, it, it really goes towards your real diet and not my, in my case, my real diet and not my saturated fat intake, which I don't think is important. And then, if you want to do mortality, the hazard ratio for all cause mortality, it's just mortality, yes or no, is 0.37 or 0.32, and the p-values again are zero. So this, this is actually, I think, one of the things that's the most interesting. It says that a decent diet, according to the USDA guidelines, the, 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 the mortality ratio, hazard ratio is a third, and the p-values are zero. And I think for me, that really was eye-opening. And I've been working on the Healthy Eating Index for a while. So diet matters, I think, but I think it's pretty obvious it does. Lots of things light up in a multivariate analysis. The components are highly correlated. So if you eat whole grains, you eat total grains, and if you eat whole fruits, you have total fruits. And so that, that complicates any kind of statistical analysis, but which is fun. But the better diets are useful. And these are really strong results, I think. And I, I, I just became a, a believer in these dietary indices because they're multivariate and it shows pretty strong results. I know lots of statisticians at the National Cancer Institute, one of whom I work with, who hates this kind of stuff, absolutely hates it, because they, they want to know what exactly should I eat. And, you know, diet affects different diseases, so it sort of depends on what disease you're interested in. But 
there are many different diets that lead to the same risks of mortality, lung cancer, colon cancer, etc. The scores give an overall pattern, but they're not, like the big complaint is the fourth bullet point. The scores give an overall pattern, but they're not a causal prescription. And hence, we should be looking for magic bullets. I don't think this makes any sense because uh, there's lots of things, lots of different good diets that all end up having about the same effect. So these are based on a food frequency questionnaire uh, where you answer questions about your diet and then you're followed for 10 years. And this is the question that I love the most is the pizza question. So how often did you eat pizza in the last, you know, in typically eat pizza? And I like the answer two or more times per day. My answer is one to six times per year. I don't eat much pizza. Usually each time you ate people pizza, how much did you usually eat? I eat everything. Okay, that sounds so good. And then how often did you eat pizza with various kinds of meats? And uh, I don't do that. I just do, what is it called? Eh, there's a bunch, there's a, a word, Italian word for it, but uh, mostly I just do the cheese and the, and tomato sauce and mushrooms and things like that. So this is one of the questions and that's supposed to summarize your pizza eating behavior. And if you think about it for about two seconds, you can say, well, that's kind of, it can't be measuring your real pizza eating behavior. And that's, that's true. So my nutritionist, then came to me with this problem where they were being told and nutritionists were thinking that 30% of children aged three to eight, US children, aged three to eight have an alarmingly bad diet. And they, they said to me, we don't believe it. And can you help? And well, this, this took me, four years to help. It's not, a, not an easy problem because uh, there are 12 dietary components plus caloric intake and it's hard to measure diet. And that's, that's what Mike was saying in the start of my lecture that, that this is a, a, a really difficult latent variable problem. And whoops, sorry. So the food frequency questionnaires are great, but you've seen the pizza question, that's not quite, that doesn't summarize pizza. So, and, and the US does, Australia does one of these too. They do, a, the US calls it NHANES, and it's a rolling two year wave of in, interviews with no overlap in the people. That's nationally represented in the US, which means they have survey waiting, complicated survey waiting. And they measure diet by two 24-hour recalls. So they ask you what you eat on two randomly selected days. And then they publish these results as, as if they're truth. Well, I don't know about you guys, but my diet depends on what mood I'm in. And certainly measuring me twice doesn't represent my diet. Today I had a very nice early meal, and uh, it was it was very very healthy. Yesterday it was not. So, so in the in the these N Haynes surveys, they're very expensive to do this. They're done by a trained interview over the phone or in person. The interviewers are usually nutritionists. There are web-based tools being deployed now to save money, but it's the key 24 hour recalls is measure what you ate yesterday. And it's not a measure of what anybody wants. And that's your long-term average intake, the variability of your intake, any of that, it's very hard to get. So it's a very good measure. It is actually a pretty good measure of intake on a single day. It's quite a complicated process to go through. 
Uh, they they do all sorts of tricks known to people in 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 uh, questionnaire. I mean, how to ask people what's going on. The sample means a pretty good pretty good uh, estimate of the population mean intake. But the sample distribution of the 24 hours is a terrible estimate of the population distribution of usual intake. And the first thing I did when, when my nutritionist asked me to investigate it is I did a little simulation. I came away convinced of my claim. So here's the study. It's aged three days, so it's a typo. The data says 2,300 children with a 24-hour recall, and 700 of them have two 24-hour recalls. It's a real survey, I'm, and uh, I would ask Ray Chambers and any other of the survey people uh, how they got the survey weights. I have no idea. And so we wanted to give realistic estimates of dietary intake distributions that account for the day-to-day -day variability that's inherent in these things. And we also want to do epidemiology in the relationship between nutrition and cancer. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but we, we've done the second, and there's more like the HGI score, the food frequency questionnaire. So here's the, pay, here's the problem. What is the distribution of dietary pattern scores? The usual intake dietary pattern scores, such as the HEI 2005, the Mediterranean Index, et cetera. So the technical part here that I loved was what do we mean by adjusted whole fruits? Well, what they're interested in is the ratio of the long-term daily average number of cups of fruit consumed cups of whole fruit consumed relative to kilocalories, the long-term daily average of calories. And in nutrition, they call these usual intakes. So this is the measurement error problem, the measurement error aspect, the latent variable aspect, that these are long-term averages and we only get to see one or two shots of the long-term averages. And we'll take it as a given that the 24 hour recalls are unbiased uh, for a 20, for a day. They're pretty good. They actually are pretty good measures. And this is the, I did the simulation, but this is the key point. In red, that's the distribution of the uh, folate intake divided by kilocalories on one single day intake. And in blue, two 24 hours. And in three, the analysis that, I, that we did that uh, is, is the usual intakes. Doesn't look like it, but in fact, the means are about the same. Um, and that should be the case. All things designed so the means should be the same. And this is, this is kind of critical the reds are shifted towards zero. And that's because folate intake, people often don't have any folate in their diet. And so there's a lot of zeros in there. And then you make a, um, you do some modeling of the kernel density estimate, which is what these are. Uh, the first two, that's the kernel density estimate, and these two, this is a, a, an analysis. And so there's a bias towards a lower, lower values. And what everybody does, not everybody, but one way to do it is they, they, the skewness you can see. And so what people often do is they transform the data and then analyze in the transform scale and then back transform to the usual original scale. And this is a, a comic of that. That's what folate intake looks like. Uh, you can transform very nicely to what looks like a looks like a Gaussian distribution. You can then do a measurement error analysis, which makes things tighter, and then you can back transform to the uh, the raw scale of 
slowly in tanks uh, compared to the densities. So that seems great, but the, the technical issue is that HEI 2005 has six components that are episodically consumed, and some of them are very episodically consumed. Uh, these are American kids, nationally represented representative survey, and you know, most Americans don't actually eat really well, but they have some fruit, but they, they usually have fruit juices, whole fruit, whole grains, mm, not so much. Good veggies, not so much. And then they have milk, these are kids, and then they always eat, everybody eats some veggies, almost. So this is whole grains. And in whole grains, you can see that about 35%, the, the number is 42%, so. This is a different study. This is what's called the yeast study. So, but a lot of people don't have any whole grains in a day. This is a single day. And then it's very highly skewed. So the, uh, the NCI developed programs in SAS using PROC NL mixed and they have models. And so they do one food at a time. And you can look it up on the web. It's called the NCI method. It, like a lot of these nonlinear mixed effects models, the NCI method often doesn't converge or you know, you're on the boundary of uh, the space for variances or whatever. The HEI analysis, which is a fully Bayesian approach, is now widely deployed, but it's very complicated. I'm, I spent years developing this thing. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's six episodically, no, no, episodically consumed means zero inflated, six zero inflated foods, six, not, no zeros, and uh, plus energy intake calories. So we had to model a lot of features in this data, covariates, dem demographics, you have to um, uh, account for the fact that people with the same covariance differ in their propensity to consume and the amounts they consume. Well, that's, that's obvious. The day-to-day -day variability is real with 24-hour recalls. Uh, there's the model of a consumption on a given day. And remember, you have to do it, or in this case, six different uh, zero-inflated sc scores. The probabilities are correlated. Uh, the variability of the amounts, the correlation, the amounts are correlated. So there's lots of correlations. There's some latent variables. There's uh, zero inflated data. It's sort of complicated. The observed amounts are skew, of course. And so we, well, I built a multivariate latent variable model with excess zeros and nothing that I, I, I couldn't do it as a frequentist. And so I became Bayesian for, which I now have become a little, much more uh, happy with, but this was back a long time ago. And Mr. Did Not Know Bayes, which was me, I figured this out. And the, fun, the hardest part of this was that t taking a year to figure out that if you eat whole fruits, you also eat total fruit. And so that just blew the model. So I had to separate it out to whole fruits and fruit juices. And that was fun. It was really a boatload of, of, of fun once, once I got it started uh, and uh, it got a PhD dissertation for a student. So it was fun. It was lots of fun. But the results were what I wanted, <laughs> which is what you said. This is the density estimates of the HEI total score. Uh, in the red, it's 125-hour recall. In the blue, it's the latent variable measurement error model. 124-hour recall is just too conservative, too pessimistic. And that's why you think that there's 30% of these kids have a total score of less than 40. 
more or less than 30 for sure. And we estimated that the, that only 8% of the children have a total score of less than 30. Now, this was something that our nutritionists were very excited by. They didn't understand the method. They didn't even want to know about the method. They just liked the answers. And I think some of us in statistics do that. It's got to be a good method because it gives the answers we expect them. And, and the other thing about this is no children in the United States have a total healthy eating index score of greater than 80. This is the density estimate, so it's very small, 0.6%. Uh, and what was funny about it is there was a White House task force on obesity. There's White House task force on everything. Um, and it was about to announce the goal that all children would have a healthy eating index uh, with a total score of greater than 80. Well, at the time, the 99th percentile was 79.4. I don't think you can change 99% of the people to completely change their diet. It was just, it was a ridiculous, it was a ridiculous goal. And so, I showed this, somebody on the task force this, this, and so they changed their goal. I still am amazed by this, to have children move to a mean of 80 and 80. And unfortunately, the means was 53 and changing from 53 to 80 in these kids is a huge, huge, practically impossible method and goal. So, I'm done. Um, I think I, I just, I love diet. I love nutrition. I love the, the molecular biology, the, the, the uh, rat trials, the microarrays, et cetera. They, they, they now focus on other things, but uh, it's, it's really, it's fun. And I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of good times doing this. With diet, it's complex. It's very complex in humans. You can do, do a controlled diet to rats, but it's very hard to do a controlled diet with humans. It's expensive to do clinical trials. They did a $400 million one looking for the magic bullet and didn't hit. Uh, and I think the magic bullet thing is very appealing. I should eat more, less saturated fat, but in humans, it's really hard to measure it. And it's, it's just really hard. I personally hate kale. And everybody says, my, my nephew says I'm doomed because <laughs> I won't eat kale. But there we go. I do like rocket, uh, which we call the arugula. So they're hard to measure. There actually are some biomarkers but not very many. So the, the, the latent variable part of this problem is not, not gonna go away. There are known effects with genetics, uh, but not so many known effects with genetics. And so I, I became convinced that you should think in terms of patterns, which appeals to the statistician in me. And I think, I hope it does to all of you that so if people want to actually understand the effect of diet on health, cancer, and mortality, they should be doing a multivariate analysis and uh, you need somebody who knows what they're doing. There are very few big longitudinal studies and there are no longitudinal studies, big longitudinal studies that have a genetic component as well. So that's, a, that's, that's really a bad thing. Um, I've talked about the healthy eating index and but there's the Harvard alternative healthy eating index basically it gets rid of milk uh, there's the Mediterranean indices there are multiple ones of those one of them I know of gets actually penalizes milk and and the the list of the number of pattern scores 
goes on endlessly because every group of nutritionists comes up with different guidelines. I think these pattern scores do provide advice and basically the advice is eat well. Don't have lots of chocolate every night. Although, yeah, so that's hard not to do. But eat reasonably well. Try and be mindful of your diet and, and you'll, you'll do okay. And the Harvard has something called the Harvard Eating Plate and it's 10 tips for healthy eating. And that's kind of amusing. This would be worthwhile to look up and see what their 10 tips are. They're, they're not stupid. And uh, they, they, they really, uh, they, they, these are tips that people can, can follow. So that's it. Um, I, I congratulate Alan on his 60th birthday some months ago. I am, I'm 71 and my, and Texas A&M is going to have a, a 70th birthday conference for me someday, you know, this, we all, we all say this someday the COVID will be done, but congratulations. It's lovely to talk to you. I, I enjoy talking about this topic and I, I hope the next time when that I can actually appear in person and Drink a glass of red wine with that one and others. Okay, thank you. Bye.